I'm Natalia, and I'm a beer sommelier and advanced cicerone. I teach people about beer for a living because I believe that beer is simply too delicious to remain undiscovered, and I want to help everyone find their favorite. In this video, we're going to talk about how to make beer. If you haven't yet watched it, I highly recommend starting with this series on what beer is made from first. As a quick reminder, beer is made with four ingredients, malt, water, yeast, and hops. Malt provides sugar that yeast ferments into alcohol and carbon dioxide in a liquid environment provided by water, and hops bring the bitterness to help balance out malt sweetness. In this video, we're going to talk about each step of the brewing process and its flavor impact. Before we get started with brewing, though, we're going to quickly recap one step that happens before the brew house, malting. Ready? Let's get started. Malt is shorthand for malted barley. In other words, barley grains that have gone through the malting process. Barley is a grain that contains starches, which serve as energy reserves for growing a new plant. But starches are long chains of sugars, and yeast can only ferment simple sugars or short chains. So the barley is put through a process called malting so that its starches can later be converted to sugars during the first step of the brewing process called mashing. As you'll recall from this video on malt, malted barley doesn't just contain starch, it also contains all important enzymes that help convert that starch to sugar. Enzymes are molecules that help speed up chemical reactions. Before mashing begins, our malt is milled or crushed, as this exposes more surface area for the enzymes to act on. Our crushed grains are then mixed with warm brewing water, or liquor as it's more technically known. During the mash, sugar is extracted from the malt and dissolves into the water, producing a sweet liquid called wort, which you may also hear pronounced wort. You may remember from this video on water that the minerals in our brewing water can alter the pH of the mash, which in turn affects the activity of malt enzymes. But enzyme activity can also be impacted by the temperature of the mash too. At a lower mash temperature, the production of simple sugars is favored. As these sugars can be fully fermented by yeast, this produces a thinner bodied, drier beer. At higher mash temperatures though, this favors the production of dextrins or unfermentable sugars. As these sugars can't be fermented by yeast, they remain in the finished beer, making it taste sweeter and feel fuller. Making adjustments like these enables brewers to really fine-tune their wort to best suit the style of beer they're brewing. During the mash, brewers can also introduce specialty malts or alternative grains to bring different colors, flavors, or textures to beer too. From here, all we want to move forward with is our sweet liquid or wort. We don't need the grains anymore as they've already given up their sugars. So we separate the liquid from the solid in a process called loudering, and the wort moves on to the next step, the boil. During the boil is when we add our hops, which give beer bitterness, aroma, and flavor. As we discussed in this video on hops, hops' bittering component, the alpha acids, need to be boiled in order to change shape, dissolve into the liquid, and impart their bitterness. But hops' aroma and flavor compounds, the essential oils, are very volatile, so they dissipate quickly during the boil. To focus on this aspect of hops' character, the spice, hops will be added late in the boil, just after the boil, or after fermentation when the liquid is cooled. This final approach is called dry hopping, and we'll mention it again shortly. The boil also plays a few other important roles. It helps to clarify the beer, making any protein settle out. The high temperatures can cause some caramelization of sugars in the wort, making malt's flavors even richer. And importantly, it's a sanitation step. So from here, cleanliness is key. Next, the boiled bittersweet wort must be filtered to remove any hop debris and cooled to a suitable fermentation temperature, which depends on what family of yeast is being used for fermentation. Broadly speaking, there are three families of beer determined by the type of yeast used, lager, ale, and mixed fermentation. As you'll recall from this video on yeast, lager yeast prefers cooler temperatures, fermenting at around 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit for 7 to 14 days at a minimum, often followed by a long cold conditioning phase. Ale yeast functions at warmer temperatures, around 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. At these temperatures, the reaction speeds up, taking between 3 to 5 days. Finally, mixed fermentation, which uses a combination of brewer's yeast plus wild yeast and bacteria, often ferments at ambient temperatures and can take from months to years. Once the appropriate fermentation temperature has been reached, yeast is pitched or added into the wort. As the yeast replicates, the sugar is consumed and alcohol and carbon dioxide are produced. Aromatic esters and phenols may also be produced, dependent on the yeast strain being used. These fruity and spicy flavors are much more common with ale yeast over lager yeast because of the temperatures they ferment at. Most beers in the ale and lager family are fermented in enclosed stainless steel vessels. Some beers in the mixed fermentation family take a similar approach initially, but the beer is often moved into large wooden barrels for aging, which house the wild yeast and bacteria that sour the beer. But mixed fermentation can also take other approaches, like spontaneous fermentation or kettle souring. 
In spontaneous fermentation, no yeast is pitched. In this very traditional method, the boiled wort is cooled in a large, shallow, open vessel, and while yeast and bacteria present in the brewery settle in and start fermenting. This beer is also long aged in wooden barrels, so more wild yeast and bacteria can be introduced that way too. In kettle souring, lactic acid bacteria is added to the sweet wort before it's boiled. The bacteria will consume some of the available malt sugars, producing lactic acid and giving the beer a sour taste. Once the desired pH has been reached, the wort is boiled, killing off the bacteria. Then, after the wort has cooled, fermentation carries on as normal. Ale yeast is pitched to give the beer its alcohol and carbon dioxide. While kettle souring is a much quicker way to make beers with a sour taste, it's important to note that these beers won't have the funky flavors or complexity found in long-aged mixed fermentation beers. Again, some brewers welcome wild microbes into their brews, while others view them as contaminants and stick to ale or lager yeast only. Regardless of the type of yeast used, fermentation is a pretty wild process, and there are often lots of other compounds produced that yeast will go back in and clean up. So, let's talk about the final step of the brewing process, the conditioning phase. As beer matures, any rough flavors age out. Lagers condition for longer than ales, further enhancing their clean fermentation character. Hops may also be added here for dry hopping, along with fruits, spices, herbs, or other ingredients and flavorings. After conditioning, the yeast will be recovered so it can be reused or repitched, as this helps with consistency from batch to batch. Beer will typically brighten or clarify during the conditioning phase as yeast and other particulates settle out. Depending on the brewery's size or style of beer, further steps may be taken to improve beer's clarity and shelf stability. Filtration is often used to remove particulates and increase clarity, while pasteurization, briefly heating the beer to kill any remaining microorganisms, can be used to give the beer a longer shelf life. Alternatively, beers can remain unfiltered and unpasteurized. From here, the beer is packaged into kegs, cans, bottles, or casks. The beer may be force carbonated prior to packaging, or it can develop its carbonation once packaged, like with cask or bottle conditioned beers. In this case, a small amount of sugar and fresh yeast is added to the beer when it's packaged. The yeast will consume the sugar, carbonating the beer right inside the vessel. Finally, the beer is shipped out to consumers to enjoy. So there you have it, a whistle-stop tour of the brewing process. In future videos, we'll be busting beer myths, introducing different beer styles, and talking about the perfect serve. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a video, and thanks for watching.